Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to use AWS Step Functions for data processing tasks. More specifically, I'm going to show you how to read the contents of a CSV file that's located in Amazon S3 and then use a Lambda function to process the results one by one. And it's really neat because this is really easy to do directly in the AWS console using the Workflow Studio here. I'll also show you how to get the Amazon state language or ASL code so that if you want to put this into GitHub or some kind of source control, you can do that as well. So let's just get right into it. And here I am in the workflow studio of the step functions part of the console. And so there's two ways to do this. You can either go to the pattern section over on the top left here, click on that, and you can see there's some S3 data processing options here. And the one that we'll end up using is this one here. So process CSV file in S3. There's also one for JSON. There's also one if you want to iterate over a list of objects dynamically, and then maybe run that through some kind of processor. So there's a lot of pretty flexible tasks that you can work with here. And the thing that I wanted to point out is that these patterns are just kind of abstractions or wrappers for different flow controls. So if you go into the flow control and you select the map task, this is basically the same thing as this pattern here, all three of these different patterns. The only difference is when you grab this one and drag it in, it, it kind of gets pre-filled with some options that are specific to this use case. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. These data processing tasks are all using the map task in distributed mode more specifically. Uh, although you don't necessarily have to use distributed mode. We'll get to that a little bit later. Anyways, let's go into patterns now. And so the one that we're going to be using is process CSV file in S3. Now, before I drag that into the section here, I just want to show you that I already do have a file in S3. If we go into my other tab here, uh, you can see I have two different files. One is a CSV file, one is a JSON file. And this is just dummy data that I created. Let me show you the contents of the CSV file. Um, so it's got 50 records. There's first name, last name, phone number, and uh, you just have you know 50 or so names here uh, for different folks. Uh, so we're just going to close that, but that's that's basically what we have in the CSV file. And in the JSON file, it's pretty much the same thing, just in JSON format. Uh, so that's what we're working with. So let's go back into step functions and drag in this process CSV file in S3 into our canvas here. Uh, and you can see it already selected a bunch of different options over on the right hand side. So let's talk through some of the different ones that are available to us. So you can see that it pre-selected the distributed mode, which is a new feature that just got announced pretty recently by AWS. And the distributed mode is, as you can see, it's high concurrency. This is in contrast to the inline mode. I believe the inline mode, you can only do 40 transactions per second. Uh, whereas with distributed, you can do, I believe it's up to 10,000 by default, but you can raise this even higher. So if you're working with really, really large workloads, distributed is the way to go. Um, and that's gonna allow you to grab data from somewhere else. It, like somewhere like in S3, or if you want, uh, you can grab it from the input to the task. So maybe something is passing in some data into your task here. You can also do it that way. Now, if you don't want to use distributed, you can use the inline mode, and that's specific for when you have data that's in your step function, you want to pass that in. But do note that you cannot use S3 with this setting. You can't use the S3 fetch uh, to grab all the data and iterate over the records one by one. That is only available in the distributed mode. So we obviously are going to use distributed, so I'm going to keep that selected. And so next, we need to answer the item source question. So where is the data set coming from? And so like we mentioned, the data set can come from the state input or S3. We're going to use S3 here. So we need to tell it where is the S3 item source. So we're going to click on this, and you have a couple different options. Um, you can either do the S3 object list, which is um, if you want to iterate over many different records. If you want to do JSON, you want to do CSV, or uh, you want to like look at a manifest file. It probably should have pre-selected this one since we did select um, over on the left-hand side process CSV file in S3. Maybe someone if uh, someone from AWS is listening, that should probably be how this feature works, but that's a different problem. Anyways, um, so now we've selected CSV. And for the S3 object, we need to tell it, like, how do we fetch the S3 object that we want to process? And what is the S3 object that we want to process? So if we click on this, you have three different options. You can either hard code uh, and enter the bucket and the key. Uh, or you can use a dynamic method, which um, may be some previous step in your step function, like something up here figures out what 
the file name and the bucket name is, in which case you would want to dynamically set what the those values are. So you would use this option, the second one. Uh, or if you're just doing this for a demo purpose and you already know what the name of the bucket and the file name are in advance, then you can do it using this method here. Um, and that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to click on Browse S3 or Enter S3 URI. And so now you can either put in the ARN or you can go to Browse S3, which is what I will do. And mine was called like Be a Better Dev Demo or something or BBD. There it is. Map Task or BBD. There it is. Uh, map Task Demo. Okay. And CSV Data uh, .csv. And we're going to choose that. And before we move on from this section, there is some additional configuration that you can do. So I'm just going to click on this. And um, so there's CSV header location. You can either just use the first row, which is kind of how my data is set up. Or if your data does not have the header, which contains um, all the column names, you can use given here. So you can, if it's in a particular sequence, you can just provide that directly in this uh, text box here. Uh, but for me, I don't need to, so I'm just going to leave that as first row. Uh, you can also limit the number of items. So if you only want, like say you have a really, really big file and you don't want to run it um, for all of those items, if you're just testing things out, you would select this. But you know, for me, I only have 50 items here, so that's fine. Um, you can also modify the items with the item selector uh, before they're passed on to the child execution. So our Lambda function in this case, maybe you want to add a certain field to the input or maybe manipulate the data using step function intrinsics that allow you to do things like hashing or figure out item count, stuff like that. But if you don't want to do that, then you can just leave that as blank. And okay, so that's it for that section. There's also this concept of batching. So um, since we're using 50 items here, batching probably doesn't make sense. But uh, if you want to pass in multiple items into your step function at, at once for each iteration, then you can select batching. So if we did it that way, we can say uh, max items per batch. So we can say 10 items. So what that effectively means in our case is that since we have 50 items, there are going to be 10 items per Lambda function execution that are passed in. And then our Lambda to function can deal with them as a group. Uh, this is great from a cost optimization perspective, and it also reduces the number of state transitions as well, which is why it is currently listed as recommended. Um, but I didn't set up the code to parse this correctly because uh, they do pass in an items array into your event object in your Lambda function. Uh, so you need to deal with that accordingly. And that's kind of beyond the scope of this demo. All right, so runtime settings, you can also set the concurrency limit if you want to uh, have only, you know, one execution at a time, 10 execution, 1,000 at a time. Um, we'll leave this as default for now. And then the child execution type. This one is important as well because uh, standard is billed a lot more than express. Um, and standard is more for like idempotent actions, things that, well, you can see here, long running, durable workflows for ETL, um, things where you want exactly once processing, you should use standard. Uh, and if you are able to tolerate at least once processing, then you can use express um, and you'll get a lot better um, cost. And the only caveat is the um, kind of debugging is a little bit more challenging because you don't get access to um, all the extra bells and whistles in the step function console for debugging and execution when it is in express mode. Uh, and that'll make sense a little bit later when I show you how to kind of look at an execution. All right, so let's leave that as standard and additional configuration. Oh, this one is, is kind of important actually. So a tolerated failure threshold. Um, so what this means is that, well, we can read it here. By default, when a single child execution fails, the map run fails. So when any one of the items that we're passing into our Lambda function in this case fails, then the whole thing will fail, which depending on your use case can either be desirable or not desirable. Um, with this option, you can set a minimum failure tolerance threshold. So if you click this, uh, maybe you're willing to tolerate like, I don't know, 5% failures in, in some case, uh, or maybe a certain number of items, then you can set this uh, to be some kind of constant. And of course, this depends on your use case. If you want to tolerate failure, or maybe this, this operation that you're working on is some kind of best effort processing, in which case this would be applicable. Um, but we are not going to use that in this case. Uh, we're going to leave it as default, in which case any Lambda failure will cause this entire task to fail. 
Uh, this is just asking for labels, which we don't need to worry about. Um, export location. This is another thing that is worthwhile to discuss briefly as well. And the way this one works is by default, whatever your Lambda function returns is going to be passed as a group to your next state. So say for example, if my Lambda function each return a string, then at the end of the map task, we're basically going to get a list of strings and that's going to pass on to our next state, which for a lot of use cases is perfectly fine. Now, however, if you want to store that data in S3, so like at the end of your processing of your map task, you want to just send all your process data to S3 um, without having to add like another, you know, put object API call here at the end, you can use this really handy feature, which is just to export map state results to Amazon S3. Uh, so you can click on this, choose the bucket where you want it to go. If you do use this, I would just be careful. You're going to want to, to process uh, or transform the output of your data because you get like a really big blob for every processed record. So for example, for every line that exists in your CSV file, um, you're going to get a big JSON object. Well, you're going to have one JSON object and it's going to be a JSON array and each item maps to, you know, one execution of your Lambda function. In this case, you're going to get all the inputs, the outputs, uh, all the metadata associated with the Lambda execution and the step function execution as well. So there's a lot of data to work with there. I would highly suggest if you use this feature to test it out on a small sample of data and then make sure that you're transforming the output correctly or using the output I believe it's called result selector to just grab the output of whatever your lambda function is returning kind of beyond the scope of this video but I figure it's worthwhile some of you may find this useful all right so I'm going to uncheck that and I think that's okay. Um, yeah, so there's input here. If you want to select certain inputs from the input object, we're not using an input object here since we're just hard coding our uh, bucket and file name. For output, if you wanna do anything with transforming the output, um, then you could do that here and error handling as well. We're not gonna use any of these in this case. Okay, so that's it for the map task itself. Now for the Lambda function. Um, so let's click on this and you can see it's highlighted as red. That's because we haven't set the function name. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is we're gonna go to function name and I believe mine is called like some kind of demo or something. Yeah, so SF Lambda demo. And just before we move on any further, I just wanna show you what this function does. Very, very simple. So, okay, so we're, first of all, we're just printing out the event and then we are going to return the first name uh, field. So whatever the first name is in our data, then we are gonna return that back. Now, the nice thing about using CSV as your uh, method type is that for every record, you get a JSON object. So in our case, it'll be like a JSON object that looks like this, right? So like first name, and then, you know, Daniel, whatever it is. Obviously, this is malformed. Um, but basically, you get the key names and the values for every record that exists in your uh, CSV file. Whereas normally when you're processing CSV, you kind of need to rely on the ordering of your data in order to understand, you know, like, okay, this is the third column. That means that the third column is phone number that therefore, you know, this value must be its phone number. You don't have to do that using this feature. You get the, the data nicely as the uh, JSON object from within the event object. So very, very handy, very uh, user friendly. One thing that I wanted to add is that if you use the batching feature, so you're, you're sending multiple records into your event or into your Lambda function, your processing will be a little bit different. There's going to be a um, items field. So it's going to look like this. So in order to process, um, like to iterate over them, you'd have to do something like for item in um, events items, then you would do, you know, like you would grab the record. So you would say, uh, item uh, first name and put that in quotes of course this will give you access to that uh, first name that's in the record um, so if you're using batching that's what you're going to want to do but not applicable for our case since we're just using one by one anyways um, this is what our lambda function is let's just deploy this to make sure it's up to date all right that's fine let's go back to step functions now and finish up the setup we already entered the function name, so that's set correctly. We're not waiting for callback, uh, payload. Yeah, this is fine. Um, we're using the state input as the payload, and that's gonna be um, from the CSV record, so that's desirable. 
Uh, next state, all this is fine. Uh, input, we don't need to do any filtering because the input is exactly as it comes. For output, um, you may want to do something here if you want to transform your output before sending it to the final state of your step function. So say for example, uh, where this could be applicable is, you know, say you want to add some extra fields to your output before you return it all the way through. Um, or you want to take things out, or you want to manipulate certain things using those uh, step function intrinsics, you can use that here. Um, so not really applicable in our case, but it's good to know about that this kind of feature is possible. We'll just leave this as default for now. Okay, so I think we're pretty much done here. This is looking correct. And let's just save this workflow now and make sure this is working correctly and do some test runs. Um, by the way, this is the ASL... Um, code that you may want to integrate with your you know infrastructure as code either in github or code commit or wherever you do iac uh, and kind of tying back to the beginning of the video you can see the type of this state is a map task even though we use that patterns thing you know patterns patterns this one here csv um, the type of the task is a map task so that just shows you that that this isn't any kind of magic it's just kind of using these different building blocks that already exist at a higher level of abstraction and so this is all the code for the asl not going to bore you with all the details but this kind of shows you all the settings that we set like here's the bucket and the key for example so uh, you can take a look at this a little bit closer if you want to set one of these up Anyways, let's go to next now and create this step function. Yeah, my state machine. Let's just call this my state machine demo. We're going to create a new role. And um, one thing to keep in mind, this handy little feature here, an execution role will be created with full permissions. So step function knows that for this particular state machine that I'm building, it's requiring some Lambda permissions, some S3 permissions for put object and get object, or maybe just get object actually. Um, so it's going to create a role that automatically has those permissions for us. And if you click on this, uh, you can see. So description, allow step functions to invoke your Lambda, allow step functions to start another workflow, to read objects from an S3 bucket, and X-ray if you want to use that for debugging. Um, so if you're not using the console here, then you're going to want to add these permissions uh, manually with infrastructure as code or whatever method you're using to provision your infrastructure, you're going to need all the corresponding permissions that are outlined in your step function definition in order for this to work correctly. All right, so that's enough blabbing on. Let's go to create state machine and then test this thing out to make sure it works correctly. One thing that I did notice is uh, that if you try to start execution like immediately after you create this state machine, sometimes it fails with a really weird IAM error. I suspect there's some kind of race condition occurring. So if, if that happens to you, you see an error trying to run this right after, just wait like 30 seconds or so, and then it'll work the second time. So hopefully 30 seconds has already expired for me talking too much. So let's go to start execution and try this out. Um, so we're creating a new one. Um, we, we don't need to provide any input in our case, but if you were using that method to dynamically set the key and the bucket name or the file name and the bucket name, you can set those values here and then tie that to your map task so that it knows, you know, maybe you'd put like um, bucket underscore name and then put that in here and file underscore name then the file name here and then you would tie these fields um, into your step function definition so that it knows to look at these fields of the input but we don't need to do that actually i can leave this as default it won't change anything or leave this with bucket name it won't change anything uh, so let's just click on start exec execution now and the blue means this is currently in process so we're just going to wait a moment or so we are currently running like processing all those items in our lambda function so if we wanted to uh, well it turned green but i was going to say if we wanted to we can go and see our step function or sorry our lambda logs to see what each function is doing but the logs aren't very interesting so i'll just kind of summarize it for you uh, so if we click on the top level task here there's some important things to note if you want to go to input you can see, you know, this was the input that we provided. That's fine. And if you go to output, you can see now these are all of the first names from every single record that was in my CSV file. And recall that that's exactly what my Lambda function does. If we look at it, uh, it's just returning the first name here. And so automatically, since each Lambda function in the map task is returning the first name, it nicely just puts this into an array for you. So you can work with this data in your next task if you so choose. 
Uh, you can also look at some of the details. If you want to look at kind of the, the success rate, the failure rate, you can see all the records succeeded here. A uh, little quirk here is that it, it says 51 records. That's because we have one uh, record, which is our header. So even though we only had 50 data records, it's still going to iterate over the top record, which is just the um, column names. Just an interesting little behavior here. Um, you don't really need to worry about definition or events, uh, but what you may want to see is like maybe one of these invocations failed for some reason. They didn't for ours, but maybe you want to dive in to figure out like kind of what happened there. Um, so in order to access each of the invocations, you can go to map run and this is the nice part about using the standard workflows. Um, remember at an earlier step, we were talking about if we wanted to use standard versus express, because I am using standard, I get to see all the execution details. So, well, you still get to see the execution details if you use express. So like what you have in front of you here, but all the details of the execution itself. For example, this is one of the Lambda invocations from within our map task. So if you click on this, you can see like for this specific invocation what was its input you know here's the first name the phone number the last name all coming from the csv and then here's the output which is sophia and if this failed you'd be able to see like what the error was and you also get access to all the details including all the events the internal kind of guts of step functions as well um, you don't get this nice ui provided if you use express although it is cheaper if you use express um, but you do get access to the logs in CloudWatch. So you'll, be, so you'll be able to figure this out, but you'll just have to, to kind of dive through logs to figure out exactly what happened. And then, you know, it's you don't get the UI, which is basically what I'm saying. Anyways, that is basically the video of how to create a step function that does data processing US, using CSV files with S3. Hope you enjoyed this video. Check out my other ones on step functions. And I am coming out with a course on step functions sometime in the next few months. If you are interested, you can subscribe to my mailing list um, down below and I should put out an update when that is available or you can just subscribe to the channel. I'm sure that I'll post that there as well. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.